Greetings. It's time to strap up and prepare for the Aiden Talks video collection that will shatter your mind. This movie will take you on an emotional roller coaster, so grip on tight and get ready to be impressed, appalled, and perhaps even afraid. Are you prepared? Let's get started. Richard Feynman said, Never confuse education with intelligence. You can have a PhD and still be an idiot. What are some real life examples of this? Story 1. My wife's stepfather was a chemist who currently has diabetes. One night, he went to the ER because his blood sugar was dangerously high. He claimed he was eating well. He normally does not, so there's no reason why his blood sugar was high. In his car was a two-liter bottle of ginger ale mixed with grape juice. He said that the two canceled their sugars out, and we didn't know what we were talking about because he was a chemist, and he knows how to combine things. Holy hell, that is insane. It is. With respect to sugar, unless you're doing a low-sugar juice, you've got the same numbers as soda, because he doesn't drink diet. But when I was hearing this, I'm just trying to imagine the taste. Ugh. This happened earlier this year, and he still argues he's right. Like, dude, you add a vodka kicker to a margarita, does it suddenly cancel out the alcohol? Or is a Long Island iced tea no longer potent because you've canceled everything else out? I'm no scientist, but I've added my sodas together when I was younger, and I've never had sudden regular tasting water. Like, he might be a chemist, but that doesn't mean he knows anything useful about diabetic biochemistry. You see this with engineers a lot, too. Engineers will be like, I know X because I'm an engineer. No, you're a mechanical engineer who works in design and finite element analysis. You do not have the same level of clarity on nuclear reactor maintenance. Your sad devotion to that ancient religion hasn't given you the clairvoyance needed to locate the stolen pl <laughs> If an ancient religion was giving my boss magical telekinetic superpowers... You better believe I would not be giving them sass. Cognitive dissonance. It's actually insane what people can convince themselves of when they really want something. Edit. I used the wrong word. Others pointed out I should have said confirmation bias, not cognitive dissonance. And they are correct. Somebody's never known the joy of a good Grinder jail. Somebody ought to go to Grinder jail. I didn't know that Steve Jobs was a chemist. But for real, Steve Jobs, by all regarded as one of the most brilliant marketers of all time, and when he was diagnosed with a more treatable form of pancreatic cancer, he said, Frack modern medicine, my organ that regulated blood sugar level? I'll just eat nothing but sugar, fruit, and that'll cure my struggling organ. Like someone with liver disease giving up water and committing only to drink beer. His stupidity in one area led to his perishing despite his brilliance in other areas. He also bought a house in another state to jump the organ donation queue and unalived that donor organ too with his stupid fruit diet. I'm literally lying in the ICU at the moment with a fresh kidney transplant, and anybody who does this smeg should be banned by UNOS, or UNOS, however it's pronounced. I'm so incredibly grateful to the woman who perished for my gift of life, and I can't wait to express my gratitude to her surviving family. May have done, but the key thing was having a private jet standing by. The key thing with transplant surgery is how quickly you can get there. The shelf life of organs is short, and Jobs had the ability to get anywhere in the continental U.S. for a transplant within six hours. That bumps you way up the list over someone who has a job and would take days to get to a hospital equipped for the operation. And yes, he was an utter wanker for taking organs that someone else could have lived with when his condition was pretty easily curable using modern medicine rather than pseudoscience. Ah, uh, I think that just boils down to just because you're smart in one area doesn't mean you're smart in all areas. I didn't know that about Steve Jobs and what his disease was, but that whole thing about mixing different sugary drinks to cancel them out 
It's just insane. It just sounds like he wanted to drink something really sweet and just really wanted to justify it in lieu of him actually being in the hospital. Your sugar was high. Your theory is kind of not proven. Story two. Peter Duisberg, molecular biologist who works as a researcher at UC Berkeley and has an otherwise stellar career and well-known for his work, became an AIDS denialist, claiming there's no link between HIV and AIDS, led countless people down the rabbit hole, including many who are HIV positive. These individuals ended up infecting others and refusing antiretroviral therapies. This included an AIDS denialist activist named Christine Maggiore, I'm not sure how that last name was pronounced, who infected her infant through breastfeeding, thinking, hey, it's not a big deal, it's just HIV, it doesn't cause AIDS. Kerry Mullis, who won the Nobel Prize for inventing PCR, also questioned the link between HIV and AIDS. I chatted with him on a plane once, and he was indeed pretty dumb. Edit. Dumb in many ways, but clearly unique and smart in others. I'm not here to bash Kerry Mullis because PCR is cool as hell, and he seemed cool in other ways, too. Met him once after a lecture at the university I was working at. It was amazing to me how he stuck to his mantra of just a surfer dude researcher who single-handedly conceived a PCR and conveniently left out the dozens of other scientists and technicians who helped with the preceding work and subsequent refinement of the process. Yeah. It was funny because when I met him, I was seated with him and another scientist, on a plane to Boston, of course. I was telling them both about some stuff I did with a fancy, at the time, version of PCR, and he just listened and then talked about surfing, mostly. And I was thinking... Who is this bozo? When I got off the plane, the other scientist was like, It's not every day you meet a Nobel laureate. And I was like, What? Who was that? And that's when he told me who it was. He had gotten Mullis' card and gave it to me, and I still have it somewhere. Also, just a surfer dude researcher who single-handedly conceived a PCR during an acid trip, so it still kind of tracks. On a similar note... There are a whole bunch of American academics of Chomsky's vintage who are Cambodian genocide deniers. They think it's an American imperialist lie meant to make a communist regime look bad. There used to be something in the 80s, there was a book about it, called The Peter Principle, meaning you sort of rise up to the level of incompetence and you just stick there. Your level of incompetence and that's where you're stuck. It kind of sounds like this. People have had some successes, and then they get up to the point where they really can't get any further because they're pretty much idiots at everything else. Story three. Not quite a PhD, but I was at a party in the UK full of med students, and stereotypically everyone was off their face drunk. Well, some guy fell over and broke his collarbone and immediately got rushed by a dozen of them all fussing and asking him the same questions over and going through the checklist. Half an hour later, and he's still on the couch in pain, and I go in to ask if anybody knows why the ambulance is taking so long. Nobody had an answer, because nobody had called one. A party full of medical students hadn't called an ambulance or made any transport arrangements for a guy in severe pain with a broken clavicle. Idiots! That's actually super common in emergencies where there's a group of any kind. One of the first things you learn in a lifeguard certification course is to identify a single person to instruct to call 911. Never just yell out, someone call 911, or assume that it's been done because everyone in the group is assuming someone else did it already. It's not necessarily that everyone forgot about it. Just that everyone assumed it was the logical first step that someone else would have taken already. Singling somebody out tends to work because in an emergency there are 50 random people all wanting to do something to help, but none of them willing to take charge of the situation for fear of fracking it up. Single someone out and you'll have taken charge of them and given them something to do that it's hard to be bad at. So they'll do it. 
Sounds like one of those situations where students or newbies in a field try to apply their newfound skills to any possible situation. I've seen it with CS students, with poll science students, and others. It's reminiscent of an oft-reposted joke about a physicist, an engineer, and a programmer trying to fix a car. There's also a saying that when your only tool is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Everyone seemed to be rushing in and going through what they learned so far, which is the checklist. It's kind of weird that nobody was told to call an ambulance or everyone assumed that the ambulance was going on. It looks like everyone wanted to contribute to the situation, but nobody wanted to take charge. I think if someone did take charge, they would have at least noticed that no one had called the ambulance or maybe at least that person should have called the ambulance. Really frustrating, especially for maybe the guy with a broken collarbone should have spoken up and said, hey, who called the ambulance? Story four. I was at a keg party at college and the gravity keg was set up. Someone complained that the beer was not flowing, so I checked that the keg was still almost full. Turns out someone closed the air intake on top. I opened the intake and poured myself a beer. Problem solved. A few minutes later, someone else complains that the beer is out. I told them the keg was full a few minutes ago and it was a tap problem that I fixed. They told me they just came from the keg. I go back to the keg and find the intake was closed again, opened it and poured the young lady who said it was empty beer. As she's leaving, my sweet mate comes in and goes to the intake and closes it. Now my sweet mate is a straight-A student who gets all A's mostly due to his photographic memory back to the keg. So I tell him that he needs to leave the intake open to let air in to displace the beer coming out of the lower tap. He then proceeds to tell me that since the beer is carbonated, air is not needed to replace the liquid volume lost when the beer is dispensed. So I asked him two questions. If it's not needed, why is there the upper tap? And does he really think the amount of gas the carbonation gives off in a glass of beer is equal to the volume of the liquid beer? He thought for a few seconds, and his only response was, I have a 4.0. What's your GPA? Then he walked away. I seriously fracking hope that was not a real response. It seems legit. I've met enough people that if you criticize one thing, they take it as a blanket statement about the entire subject. You know, it's 20 degrees Fahrenheit outside. Timmy really should be wearing a jacket while he's sitting at the bus stop. Oh, you think I'm just a terrible person, huh? No. I think Timmy should be wearing a jacket. I hope your response was, Awesome! Your GPA matches your IQ. Well, no, the response should have been, Can you pour me a beer? What's a subtle sign of low intelligence? Story 1. Thinking their opinion slash perspective is also everyone else's. Thinking no one does that because they don't do that. Everyone puts their cereal at the top of the pantry. That's just where it goes. My sister. Yeah, not me. I believe overgeneralization from self is the technical term for it. I'm an experimental psychologist. The false consensus effect is the term you're looking for. Overgeneralization from self isn't a phrase I've heard. If someone in my field, social psychology, were to use it, I would guess that person was referring to maybe self-other overlap? An entirely different concept. This guy hasn't heard it, so no one has. Sorry, I believe you. I, I just couldn't resist. I thought this too for many years. About ten years ago, I learned that this is a trait of many people with autism spectrum disorder. For many people with ASD, they simply cannot fathom that someone would not like the same things they like slash keep things in the same places. It's not an intelligence issue for them. It's the way their brain works. This was a light bulb moment for me as a parent to an autistic kid. Remember, everyone thinks differently. It's something I say often. I don't know why you're mad because I don't have the same thoughts. Edit. Thank you, anonymous person, for my wholesome award. I didn't know that was a thing. I hope you all have a great day. I have this problem, and I usually get mad when I feel like the other side doesn't understand me and my way of thinking, else they would come to the same conclusion. Growing up, I realized it's a waste of energy, and I just don't care for the most part. But with people I care about, 
I can still get riled up when if they have an extremely different opinion than me, and, and if I can't understand why, I get furious. Sometimes I just like to turn it off and stop caring altogether. Especially sucks since I annoy only people that I care about with it. I kind of feel I had this growing up. I kind of feel that kids have it growing up. That's why they get so annoying as teenagers, because they think they know everything. Or maybe that's just a general consensus. I kind of found myself getting out of that way of thinking when I started traveling more and experiencing different cultures and realizing not everybody thinks the same way I do or people in America do. So I'm thankful for that. Story 2. I need to please her for many reasons. I guess the first and foremost is because that's what I would want from a significant other. However, in the last year or so, it's been more just because I cannot stand her when she's upset because she takes it out on me. I'll try to explain the final straw for me. Basically, my work schedule changed from working 12-hour shifts overnight with dedicated days off to 8-hour shifts overnight with maybe one day off. She works from home 30 hours a week in the morning, so our time together has been cut shorter. We both love video games, and lately we've been playing one together. Even though the game in question isn't my cup of tea, it used to be, but after hundreds of hours of play it's dull to me, I still play to see her happy. It's not terrible, but I would rather be doing something else. However, because of my schedule, we don't have much time to get into the game, so she's been wanting me to wake up earlier. Mind you, I'm still adapting to the new hours at work, suffer from sleep apnea, and have always had trouble sleeping. I spent about a week where every single day I would wake up, play our game, go to work, come home, maybe play some more, and go to bed. And that's it. Nothing for myself, despite having several talks about how the game just isn't keeping my attention anymore and I'd like to do something else, even together. Not good enough for her. She has been struggling to find entertainment by herself lately, and this game with me playing is all she wants. And since we could get a max of two hours before I go to work, it's already not enough for her. So I tell her I will try to get up earlier, literally cut my own sleeping hours down so we have more time together. But I said I need her help because I'm bad at waking up. She knows this. We've been together for almost five years. Next day, she tries to wake me up, and I'm half asleep and barely even remember it. She goes and makes food in the kitchen. I'm slowly waking up laying in bed at this point. I lie in bed for about another half hour, then go take my morning dump. When I exit the bedroom, all the food is already put away. I find her crying in the den. She cries all the time because she has never been able to deal with even slight disappointment. I ask what's wrong and she just lies to me saying how I don't care about her because if I did, I would get up earlier and play. I lay right back into her saying, I'm not her fracking pet, saying I've spent every single waking hour lately doing either what she wants me to do or being at work. Nothing else. I say to help me get up earlier with more than just a light touch on the arm, maybe sit with me and talk or something, and she says, She's not my mother and shouldn't have to do that for a grown man. She loves to wound me like that, belittle me, and make every attempt of compromise into some act of contrition. There's tons more, of course, but it always boils down to this kind of argument, where she expects more out of me but refuses to budge on compromise. Meanwhile, every single time I bring up an issue I have with her, which is very seldom, it's either turned around on me, well, you do this too when you insert thing I did years ago, or blames it on her ASD. She refuses to go to any kind of therapy or doctor. I have my own health issues too. I have terrible ADHD and anxiety, but if I ever use them as an excuse for, say, the times where I zone out while she's talking, it doesn't matter to her. All that matters is that her feelings are hurt. I can count on one hand 
how many times she has said she was sorry or apologized in five years. Meanwhile, I apologize every single time she brings something to my attention and try to work on it. She is not the center of the universe, and I am so, so, so tired of eating smeg and feeling worthless. Sorry for the essay. I didn't mean to write this much. I'm just in a smeggy place right now. Just gonna keep drinking until she can move out. Who knows how long that will take. There should be a better solution for that. It just sounds like she's just demanding. That could be true of either person in a relationship, man or woman. And just manipulative. And I don't think she has very much self-awareness if she's able to find herself blameless but turn every problem around on him. I hope he just doesn't do the drinking thing and just finds a way to get out of the relationship. It sounds like he deserves much better, especially with how giving he is to the person in the relationship that he's in. Story 3. Thinking the world is simple. Arguing in absolutes. The world is definitely not simple, but I like to look at it from a simplistic point of view because it makes me feel less anxious and it lets me enjoy life better. But I agree, it's definitely a complicated world we live in. Honestly, thinking about almost anything is simple. I've seen it so many times. I still joke with some co-workers about a boss and his cronies who would constantly interject, It's pretty frackin' simple. In discussions ranging from politics to civil engineering, e.g. someone mentions welfare and you'd get, It's pretty frackin' simple. Don't just hand money out to people for nothing. Why would anybody ever try to get a job if we just gave them money? This is so frustrating, especially given that it impacts how people vote. The comment section of news articles on the BBC website about Brexit, for example, were full of simplistic statements by readers. Many of them started with the word just, and many ended with simples, or most infuriatingly, end of. This was at a time when an influential British politician claimed that the people of Britain were fed up with experts, which I'm sure was met with gammon-faced agreement by all those who think that all we need to do is a simple common-sense solution that the so-called experts are too blind to see. COVID has seen similar opinions from people who get their information from Facebook or from some guy spouting off in the pub. It's the mindset of people who are unaware of the complex nuances of the situation and seek what they think is, is an easy, uncomplicated solution. It's deliberately ignoring what experts say because acknowledging that it's too difficult for them to understand properly leaves them feeling insecure. It's not always blissful. There are nihilists who complain that life is not worth living because it makes no difference in the grand scheme of things. Their perspective is so devoid of detail that they can only see things at the most absolute broad level possible. There are those who meet or hear about some bad people and then claim that all of humanity or life in general is bad and must be extinguished. It's like they deny the existence of light because there's darkness and can't fathom a universe where both can exist. It's really sad in my opinion. A lot of those people seem to be dealing with severe depression. I've been there, but instead of recognizing that the problem is within themselves, they try to use reason to justify their depressive thinking as universal truths. Like, yeah, there is some bad stuff out there, but that's not all there is. And lacking the ability to see the good doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. I'd say it's more a lack of wisdom than a lack of intelligence, though. It takes quite a bit of intelligence to rationalize and draw conclusions. But it takes wisdom to choose a method of rationalization that leads to conclusions that are meaningfully or usefully relevant. I'm reading this and all I'm thinking of is Thanos from the Marvel movies. He had so much power. All the gems and all the Marvel people are probably going to drag me for not remembering all the names of the gems off the top of my head. Time, space, matter, I, I forget. There were five of them and he had like absolute control over everything, over such complex concepts and abilities. And his solution was simple. Eliminate half the people. I think that's your example right there of this. 
What's the worst excuse for cheating? Story 1. This one happened to a good friend of mine. I was with him just after this little gem was dropped on him, and it took him some time to recover. I wasn't actually cheating on you. I was dating another guy first, so I was actually cheating on him. Madam President of the Society of Pedantics didn't see an issue with what she said. Edit. Holy hell, this blew up more than I thought it would. Waking up to see all the kind words people online are sending me has made me smile today. I'll try to reply to as many as I can. My friend is doing well. He stopped dating for a while to focus on himself and improving his own situation. It's a little over a year after the breakup with his ex, and he's doing well in life. To everyone who has had a similar slash the same thing happen to them, I'm so sorry. You deserve better. Remember, you're loved. There are people who genuinely love you in your life. If you have someone in your life that fake loves you, you don't deserve that. And they don't deserve you. I, I don't get that one. That's, yeah, maybe in a very pedantic way you weren't cheating, but you were seeing someone else that wasn't him. You were lying about it and you were sort of fudging your feelings on each person. That's still all the stuff that goes with cheating without calling it cheating. And I just don't, it, it just sucks still, still. Story two. Unfortunately, some people want drama. A friend of mine got cheated on. His girlfriend slept with a guy while on vacation. Didn't tell him, obviously. He found out because one of her friends felt bad and told him. When he confronted her about it, she dumped him via Facebook. Didn't even have the guts to do it in person or with a phone call, claiming he was boring. When I was discussing this with my other friends, I really couldn't figure out why someone doesn't just end the relationship they're not happy about. Another friend said that it probably wasn't exciting enough for her. FYI, he's now happily married to someone else, obviously, and with a kid, but the cheating hurt him badly. I was dumped via message before. This was instant message before phones. It did kind of sting just that little bit more that this person didn't even talk to me in person or even talk over the phone. So, yeah, that's that stings just that little bit more. Story three. She's your twin. Does it really count as cheating? I dated a girl with an identical twin. One night, I came up behind her, wrapped my arms around her, and planted a gentle kiss on her neck. Normally, she liked that a lot, but this time she said, What the frack are you doing? It was her twin. So embarrassed. <laughs> Luckily, they both saw the funny side because it's happened before. I have heard of some twins that will try to get out of a situation by convincing their twin to go in their place or them just trying to see what would happen. Thankfully, this person at the end was able to escape any type of persecution that we know of. <laughs> Story 4. When you cheat, you get the excitement of something new and the danger of getting caught. You also get to dump all the emotional legwork of breaking up on your partner. It's win-win if you don't mind being the scum of the earth. They overlook the lose-lose part of the equation. Story 5. I'll never forget my first semester in college. I met a girl in Psychology 101 that shared with the whole class that her boyfriend cheated on her. She said she was going to forgive him because his reason for cheating was because he had never slept with a black girl before and wanted to know what it was like. Story 6. Came home early from work to my last ex in bed with another guy. I wasn't trying to hurt you. I didn't think you would find out. I came home early because I spilled a fryer on my leg and she ignored my call for a ride because she was busy being smashed. I'm still mad when I think about it. Man, I'm sorry to hear about that. She's fracking terrible, man. That really sucks. He's getting emotional and physical trauma that he is going to be dealing with all at once. I just wish he could have dealt with like the physical pain first and at least then the emotional pain second. But if he came out of all of that stronger with dealing with both at the same time, 
then I'm glad he did. Story 7. Ex-girlfriend tried to get one of my close friends to do things with her. When he told me, and I asked her about it, she told me she liked him, but still liked me more. That was the last straw. At least now you know you have a good and trustworthy friend. Story 8. You aren't exactly my type. Actual quote, after three years of living together. A bit late to recognize that, huh? What a douche. Sorry you had to go through that. Story 9. It just happened. The storm was so strong it shredded our clothes off and we had to hold on tight to not fly off. I guess a gust of wind pushed my tool into her. There was a whole series of ads from MTV that were comic-style interpretations of these really intricate Rube Goldberg-type situations where somehow they end up having, these two people end up having spicy time, and it was a whole thing to tell you to be protected because it just does not happen. Story 10. Sorry, we started the threesome without you, but your friend filled in for you. Story 11. I got called wussy for not cheating on you in a dream. This has to be one of the worst ones. Story 12. I thought it was funny you didn't know. Yep, that actually happened to me. I'm trying to figure this out because it could read a couple of ways. It sounds like the person is either thinking this is a practical joke, and they said, I thought it was funny you didn't know, or that they had thought that the other person knew they were seeing another person all along and was just saying, oh, I thought it was funny you didn't know. Either way, that's just totally devoid of any feelings for how the other person is going through all this. Story 13. I was looking for an excuse to break up. If you want to break up, why don't you just break up? Story 14. I lost focus and had a consensual workplace relationship. Ned Fulmer. Story 15. I respect you too much to do with you what I did with them. Story 16. I thought about you the whole time. Story 17. You're too nice. I'm doing you a favor. Story 18. She's way hotter than you. Story 19. One that I heard from a former marriage counselor was a woman who claimed her husband was so affectionate, hardworking, and considerate she developed an inferiority complex and dealt with it by cheating. Story 20. Dude, people joke about this, but it's a real flaw if it's true. Imagine if someone was honest about it and said, My biggest flaw is that I'm a perfectionist. I spend too long on every task because I feel really uncomfortable if things aren't done right. This also makes me avoid starting tasks or taking on projects because I know they'll all be a ton of work and stress me out. I also get frustrated with my coworkers during group projects because they don't have the same standards, so I'll either end up redoing some of their work and resenting the burden, or I'll leave it that way and feel smeggy about the whole project. I'm afraid to try things that I don't think I'll be good at. I hate doing presentations because I can see these tiny flaws in my work, and I'm terrified that other people will see them too. I simultaneously believe that my work is better than everyone else's, and that my work is so imperfect that I'll be immediately fired if anyone looks closely. I can't handle rejection on any level. People think I'm stuck up, but I really just have a lot of anxiety, and I'm afraid that people will see that I'm deeply flawed and they'll hate me without telling me, so I'm a little stiff and aloof with new people, so sales and team bonding exercises are out. I'll eventually quit with two weeks' notice when you pass me up for a promotion because you went with someone who is sloppy but charismatic. Story 21. The lights were off. I couldn't see. Story 22. He caught me cheating. Serves him right for spying on me. Random girl I overheard talking on her phone. That's exactly how my ex tried to gaslight me when I caught her. You did this to yourself. You went through my phone looking to get hurt. I went looking for answers, which is exactly what I found. Story 23. It was my birthday, and I really wanted to. Story 24. I noticed that instead of saving money, we were losing about $6,000 of our savings per month. We had a specific dollar goal to put a down payment on a house. When I looked into it, I found out my ex-wife was spending over 6 k a month. 
She got upset and said that she should be allowed to do whatever she wanted to with our money. She had been buying random URL names in the hopes one would be the name of an up-and-coming business that would have to buy it from her. Like a patent troll, but with websites. I had been working my butt off picking up extra work travel to save money for us, and then took up even more work trips to make up for the losses and get us back on track to buy a home. After that, whenever I returned home, she was cold and distant. I tried to be affectionate to her, and she told me to hook up with other women while on my work trips because she wasn't in love with me anymore. She said she loved me like a cousin and hoped we could continue being married but in a non-traditional way, meaning she could still spend all my money. When I found out she had been cheating, she said that she stopped loving me when I criticized her use of our savings and then started traveling more, which gave her time to reconnect with an ex. She had broken up with the ex about ten years prior when he became a pill-popping horse addict. When they reconnected, he was clean, so she left me for him. So the reasons were, one, I shouldn't have been upset about her using our savings to buy website names instead of a down payment on a house. Two, if I didn't get upset at the loss of all that savings, I wouldn't have picked up more work giving her the time and space to reconnect with her ex. And three, she's always loved him and he was clean now. Please like and subscribe if you've made it this far. I hope you'll enjoy the rest of the video and have a wonderful day. What's something you learned embarrassingly late in life? Story 1. It took me 18 years to realize shampoo goes before conditioner. I always wondered why my hair felt silky smooth before I used the shampoo. How does this happen? Did they start off in life using soap to wash their hair and got introduced to shampoo later on, shampoo and conditioner? I... I'm trying to think of how that happens. How do you get introduced to conditioner first? Weird. Story two. I'm from Mississippi, and until I was 18, I thought that everyone else in the country counted with their own state. I.e., instead of one Mississippi, two Mississippi, they would count one Nevada, two Nevada, or one Maryland, two Maryland. <laughs> That's pretty good. So for me, it would be one California, two California. I don't know. That almost feels like it would take up the same time as Mississippi. People in Maine must travel much faster in time than the rest of us, though. Story three. It wasn't until I was about 20 that I discovered that you're supposed to add water to condensed soup. Very vividly remember eating condensed tomato soup in my dorm room without any water, so was essentially eating ketchup. Ooh, that's bad. I've run across soups, canned soups, later on in life where you don't have to add anything to it. But, man, that's just... How did you heat it up? I mean, I guess... I mean, were there microwaves available in this person's time? I could just imagine heating up a big glop, a big thing of red glop in a pan, and then trying to choke that down. Story 4. That players on American sports teams do not all originally come from the area where their team is from. Story 5. My dad was fond of framing questions to my brother and or me regarding just what on earth we were doing, up to age 10 or so, when it no longer seemed necessary, using the term... Pray tell, as in, what are you doing with the tools, pray tell? I assumed a pray tell was a gentle equivalent to goofball or dummy. One day, I corrected my brother about some misconception he had, addressing him as, you pray tell. What did you call him? asked dad, who happened to be nearby. A uh, pray tell. You call us that all the time. I do. Yeah, you say, what is that supposed to be, pray tell? I'd never seen him laugh through a face palm before. Story 6. Knowledge is power. France is bacon. Everyone needs to read the story they're referring to. It's incredible. Yeah, this is one of those misheard things. Look up the story if you can find it, but basically it's not France is bacon. It's Francis Bacon, the, I believe it was contemporary to Shakespeare and uh, believer in the empirical method of science. 
Story 7. I didn't know tortilla chips were made out of tortillas until I was 20 years old and saw the line cook at my job cut up a tortilla and throw it in a deep fryer. Story 8. I thought ponies were just baby horses until the age of 23. Edit. Until I was 23, I didn't think horses aged like turtles. I'm dumb, but not that dumb. Okay, so I read that as baby horses are known as ponies until they officially become adult horses at the age of 23. Considering that the average lifespan of a horse is like 30 years or something, I was shocked that the commenters below had thought the exact same statistic as you did. Story 9. Until I was in school for environmental studies, I thought morning dove, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, was morning dove, M-O-R-N-I-N-G. I usually heard them calling in the morning, so morning made sense to me. All right, I'm... I'm the same on this one. I thought it was morning like the time of day as well. I had to look it up to make sure. And right, it was morning as in mourning the loss of someone. I wonder why it got that name. I'll have to look it up later. What do you think? Story 10. I was maybe 17 or 18 before learning that it was Timbuktu. T-I-M-B-U-K-T-U. Not Timbuktu. T-I-M-B-U-K-T-U. The number two. I thought there was an original Timbuk out there somewhere. I was about 25 when I found out Timbuktu was a real place. I had thought it was just an expression for a faraway place. Story 11. I thought a sedan was a car brand until I was 22. I thought that until I heard the joke, why do chicken coops have two doors? Because otherwise they'd be chicken sedans. And it all made sense. Story 12 that all the places in France were not named after wines. That's kind of like knowing that all the places in America are not named after different types of hamburgers. And when you're thinking about it, Philly cheesesteak, Chicago pizza, all the different types of foods, yeah, you know, you could see how that someone might believe that. Story 13. When I was really young, my sister told me she threw her guts up. So I was really afraid of vomiting my entire insides up for years. Story 14. That a prostitute doesn't actually sell a piece of their body. Backstory. My mom and I were watching the scene from Titanic where Jack tells Rose that he painted a one-legged prostitute. I asked my mom what a prostitute was and she told me it's someone who sells their body for money. I could not fathom why someone would sell their leg for like $30. Story 15. Things aren't supposed to start to get blurry at about 15 to 20 feet. Learned I needed glasses at like 26 from one of these threads. Yes, people, you are supposed to be able to see individual leaves on trees. Hope someone else can be helped like I was. I'll never forget the first time I looked up at the night sky after I got glasses and realized that you can, in fact, see the moon clearly. I assume people who depicted it in art were taking creative license because they knew it should look like that for some reason, and that the human eye was incapable of seeing the moon without also seeing two other blurrier moons sort of overlapping it? It blew my mind. Story 16. My childhood friend is colorblind, usually confused blues and purples, and he recently confided in us that he thought artists massively over-exaggerated rainbows in drawings and cartoons. When he looks at a real rainbow... The blue-purple end of the spectrum blends into the sky, so essentially disappears, and the red-green end all merges into a color that he sees as yellow-brown, and so to him, a real rainbow just looks like a yellowy line. Obviously, cartoon rainbows often have very bold, distinct color lines, so he can interpret those more clearly, but he was in shock to hear that non-colorblind people can actually see every color in an in-real-life rainbow. Story 17. I live near the hospital for joint diseases. When I was a kid, I thought it was a hospital for people who had two different diseases at the same time. Story 18. Moving cross-country, driving east to west. Crossing from Idaho to Oregon, I noticed huge fields with signs for the Or-Ida Potato Company. So I was in my early 20s when I figured out Or-Ida wasn't just a brand name, 
but was because their potatoes came from Oregon and Idaho. Story 19. When people say, quote, unquote, I thought they were saying, quote, unquote. Story 20. When I was a teenager, I posted a status online that said I was jacking off. I thought that meant you were just bored and wasting time, until my older sister messaged me, horrified. Story 21. My parents were divorced the whole time, and my mom was not, in fact, taking a vacation. <laughs> we're telling our kids that certain actors are on vacation when we need a change of scenery from a certain show like Blippi or Coco Melon or something. Story 22. That a coma was a coma. Until I was probably 19, I thought it was a coma. I thought you fell into a coma. For the longest time, I thought astigmatism was a stigmatism, so I think we cancel each other out. Story 23. I thought all tombstones had a cause of unaliving on them, like old-timey ones. R.I.P. must have meant that got ripped to unaliving somehow. The world was scary. <laughs> Story 24. Let me tell you about how I thought you were awarded a pullet surprise. Story 25. I learned that pork and beans are not called cowboy beans. I was 18 and asked a grocery store clerk to help me find the cowboy beans. We were looking everywhere and I was getting frustrated because I know that every store carries these beans. After a while, I pick up a pork and beans can with a picture and say, See, it looks just like this. He said, You mean pork and beans? Then I realized that my mom called them that so that I would eat them. The look of disappointment from that grocery store clerk haunts me to this day. Cowboy beans are a real thing, and different families make them different. But it's generally baked beans with added meat. So pork and beans would technically qualify, although usually there's a higher meat ratio if you make them for a potluck or something. My family recipe had bacon, ground beef, and maybe a little ground Italian if you're feeling fancy. And sometimes other types of canned beans are added and simmered in the sauce for a bit. Edit. For everyone who asks how this differs from chili, the only way I've seen them made around me is with Bush's baked beans or a homemade but similar sauce as the base. So it's a sweet molasses or brown sugar sauce versus a chili seasoned tomato based sauce. Also, more bacon than one would usually put in chili. Story 26 Oral Contraceptive. You mean you can get pregnant just from doing that? What movie is a 10 out of 10? <laughs> this one's gonna be good, and I hope I don't run into any spoilers. Story 1. Fargo, 1996. The performances in this movie by Francis McDormand, William H. Macy, and Steve Buscemi were all career-defining performances, but what I don't see mentioned enough is how the movie is an antidote for Tarantino's style of criminals. Pulp Fiction is out of this world, but it led to every director trying to write smart, well-read criminals who talk about TV and movies. A big example would be Bad Boys, whereas the Coens created idiotic criminals who keep making mistakes and aren't cool in any way. They even start the movie off by messing up their time for the meeting. I've watched this movie so much I think I could quote it in my sleep. I love what you said about the sort of class of criminal portrayed. That's also what I love about the TV show, especially season one. Both Lester and Malvo are each different sorts of criminals, and they're both portrayed exceptionally. Lester is a selfish opportunist, the regular guy that turns to crime because he has an opportunity and wants to get his. Malvo, on the other hand, portrayed by Billy Bob Thornton, is just out of this world, almost like a trickster god in human skin sowing chaos for no reason. His portrayal is both hilarious and chilling. Also, Marge Gunderson is one of my favorite movie characters of all time. Marge Sanuva Gunderson. The Coen brothers do such an amazing job of juxtaposing the mundane and folksy with their macabre in such a way that forces you to realize that the most disgusting and disturbing stories you've ever heard are populated with people that are so normal that if you met them, you'd think they were boring. The ending in particular, where 
Franny Mack is lying in bed with her husband and listening to him whine because his Mallard sketch was used for the two cents stamp after she just unraveled this story of corruption and unaliving that ends with her walking up on some guy as he feeds someone else into a fracking wood chipper is just... They're the best filmmakers of my generation. Also, the TV show derived from this universe is unstoppably great. Said this in another comment, but it's more remarkable than most people realize. Typically, the pregnant woman is a vulnerable figure in film. They literally flipped the script and made her the hero. That's what I loved so much about her character. We get to see her be an adorable little pregnant lady enjoying food and stuff, but then she's also a totally fearless, bad-to-the-bone person. <laughs> yeah, I love that movie. I love how everything is couched in that Minnesota accent. It's kind of hard to take everything kind of seriously, but they portray everything so normally and so realistically that you have to wonder that this whole crime spree and everybody is talking in this, what some people think is a, is a funny accent. <laughs> Story two. The day before opening night, my friend and colleague Jim says to me, We're going to a movie tomorrow night. What movie? Not telling you. What's it about? Not telling you. Genre? Are you threatening me? What time are we leaving? That's more like it. I went in knowing zero about the movie, as in N-O-T-H-I-N-G, other than the name. And that was until after we bought the tickets. Going on the journey like that, not knowing anything, was one of the greatest gifts Jim could have given me. I was out of town the weekend it came out. All my college buddies went and saw it. As soon as I got back, they were all, Dude, we're going to see The Matrix right now. Didn't tell me a single thing. I was lukewarm on the trailers. Practically forced me into the car. Movie blew my mind. Eternal props to my friends for not spoiling anything and forcing my dumb butt to go see it before anyone else could ruin it for me. <laughs> my dad picked me up from school and was all excited about this new movie he saw the day before, and he was like, we're going to watch it right now. I hadn't heard of it, but he was almost manic trying to tell me how great it was without spoiling it for me. I remember... He failed to keep it in and explain the whole situation thing, but it didn't matter. That movie took 13-year-old me on a ride. I don't think that experience will ever be topped. Contrast with most trailers today where you know exactly what it's about and most of what will happen in 30 seconds. Oh, that movie was a revelation, seeing that in the theater. I mean, I don't know if I'm... Yeah, I'm not going to cast spoilers, I would say if you haven't seen it, see it, go see it. It's got a very 90s sensibility, especially with the music, but it's still amazing. And it's an action movie and in ways kind of thought-provoking too, but beautiful. It's an anime come to life, basically. Amazing. Story 3. City of God. I can't really explain why, because I haven't studied films and stuff. I can explain because it's a once-in-a-lifetime film made with amateur actors about once-in-a-century memoirs written by a guy that never wrote anything again. It bounces seamlessly between a comedy, a crime drama, art house, biopic, documentary, and a quirky romance movie. It's gritty, grimy, kind of horrifying, yet hilarious, uplifting, and a riot to watch. Also, the cinematography at times reaches a fever-inducing pace or cleverly conveys some other contextual messages or plainly is just brilliant with shots and production design coming together. The scene about the apartment is a standout. Perfect film. It's the best movie that I'll never watch again. That would be either Requiem for a Dream or House of Sand and Fog for me. I have never got that feeling from City of God, though. Guess I'm forced to watch it again. I love telling the story of when I watched Requiem for a Dream. It was a couple months ago into freshman year of college. My roommates and I invited some girls from down the hall over to hang out before a party that night. We had a couple hours to uh, take care of, so we decided to watch a movie and have some drinks. 
One of the girls looked through my roommate's DVD collection. He had like 200 DVDs and was like, Hey, this one with the eye on the cover looks cool. Let's watch it. Most of us had never heard of it, so we agreed. When the movie started, it was a typical college hangout. We were drinking and chatting and just half watching. By the middle of the movie, nobody was drinking anymore. By the end, we were all completely silent other than the occasional, Holy hell. When the movie ended, we all just kind of sat in silence for a few minutes. Nobody knew what to do or say, but we all knew we were in unspoken agreement that we were not going to a party that night. Uh, I've heard about the uh, impact of Requiem for a Dream. City of God, I keep hearing about. I'll tell you, I haven't seen that one, and I guess I should see it if it's going to be that much of a roller coaster, but I guess I need to prepare for it. Story 4 Amadeus. Man, why the hell does Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart have such a cool name? His baptized name is even cooler. Johannes Chrysostomus Wolfgangus Theopolis Mozart. I still marvel at the scene where Salieri is looking over Mozart's music and is hearing the music in his head as he's reading the notes. Can people really do that? I can read I still marvel at, and I'll know in my head what that'll sound like if spoken. And if I tell you... Imagine that James Earl Jones or Gilbert Gottfried is speaking the comment that I'm writing here. I'm sure you can hear them in your head to some extent. It's not too different from music scores. Anyone who can read sheet music should be able to recognize a piece without having to physically play this bit first. Not instantaneously, obviously, but probably after a couple of seconds of looking at it. Edit. Obviously, there's people on both sides of the spectrum but I believe this amount is what you'd consider normal. You don't need to have years of musical background or be awfully gifted to hear parts of a score. Oh man, I seriously did not have that scene in the back of my mind when writing the comment. So your reply read like the most random generic response ever. Glad I googled it. Beautiful reference. I literally only chose Eine Kleine Nacht music because it's easily recognized. Gotta love how we just recreated that scene. Story 5 12 Angry Men. Every time I watch it, I find new details to admire. Edit. The 1957 version. And be sure to check out 12 Angry Men Analysis by Sherbrick. 12 out of 12. Or realizations. As a kid, I treated it like a logic puzzle. Like if you paid enough attention, you could figure out the case, figure out the right answer. That, of course, was missing the point. A lot of modern lawyers and judges believe the jury actually made the wrong choice in the movie, mostly based on how much circumstantial evidence there is against the defendant. Not to mention the fact that the jury does a ton of hypothesizing, and Juror 8 especially introduces new evidence which would definitely not be allowed under the judge's instructions. I don't see why. The case itself is circumstantial. Factor in, this is regarding the death penalty, and the strongest facet they have is eyewitness. The case is far too shoddy for anyone to think guilty when that's the result of a guilty verdict, which is why the death penalty is pretty smeg. The kid probably did it, and since it can't be concretely proven, unaliving him over probably is total hogwash. What is the best comeback that works against all insults? Story 1. Earnestly ask them if they're okay. Too long didn't read? Being in the trades gets you some good practice in comebacks. I'm an electrical apprentice, and when I first started, there was a bit of hazing and teasing from the journeyman. It never got too bad, mostly a lot of talk. One in particular was kind of on me one day, and since he was fairly young, just recently licensed, I just responded with, Did someone treat you like this when you were an apprentice? Do you have some unresolved issues? Do you need a hug? Oddly, he never really responded, but I didn't have any trouble with him anymore. On the same job, the excavator accidentally broke our grounding grid, a big underground copper cable grid used to ground all the structures in the substation. So I had to jump down in the rain into the hole to patch it up. It was wet and muddy, but I was wearing a full rain suit. Another older journeyman who was my foreman and had worked for my father more than once made a sarcastic remark along the lines of, We should take a picture. Wouldn't your daddy be proud? I just looked up at him and said, Well, I'm doing my job. I'm doing it well. 
and I'm not whining and complaining about it. Yeah, he likely would be proud. I also had another apprentice yell at me, Stop talking to me like I'm a fracking moron! To which I responded, Stop talking to me like you're a fracking moron! I did kind of provoke him, but he was being really dense. These are all perfect retorts that I could only come up with in the shower the next day. Pro tip, coming up with clever comebacks way after the time you need them is not such a major problem if you choose to work or live in an environment where you get insulted and abused frequently. You can just use them for the next time. I was about to make a bragging comment about having a quick wit for things like this, but now I'm thinking I'm just smeg and at an awful lot of things. Enough so that I've had to get good at handling hecklers. Ah, the immortal French staircase wit. I have a new confidence knowing I have this in my back pocket. Thank you. Yep, working in a mechanic shop got me exposed to constant smeg talking. 95% of it in the intimacy-oriented genre, or gender-oriented genre. I didn't learn much there other than to have a thick skin. I play hockey, and locker rooms can get fun with all sorts of trash talk flying around. My favorite was actually directed at me. I had a headache and nausea, turns out from a concussion in our previous game, and my teammate looked at me and said, I got a straw in my car. Confused, I say, a straw? And mate replies with, yeah, so you can suck it the frack up and play. Hilariously brutal roast and all in good fun. Well, again, you got to get a thick skin on some of this. There's a lot of stuff you can brush off, but I do like that reaction of just not going the way you expect them to go and just be serious and who hurt you, basically. That's pretty good. Story two. I like this one, actually. I feel like it's the least argumentative comeback here. Deflecting people or responding with a witty thing can just rile them up. Source, psycho family. As they take it the same way as being ignored. This one gives a sort of illusion that you accept what they've said and have already moved on from it. Like, I heard what you said, I've taken it in, and I let it go. Before the bully really has a chance to process it themselves. I feel like there's still room for reconciliation after this response. It's important to remember the other person in these situations. Not because we should be empathetic towards their abusive choices, but because we should be empathetic towards their lead-up emotions. My five-year-old says mean things sometimes because he hasn't practiced patience and understanding enough. He's learned how to properly react but he's not mature enough to utilize it properly any time, every time he gets worked up. This is not unexpected of a five-year-old. A lot of people much older than five also are similarly emotionally immature. My husband doesn't have much practice with patience before he met me. Ten years later, and he's all mellowed out. I'm not perfect, of course, but I'm confident in my ability to stay cool in the face of craziness, which helps me remember to think of the other person. When my husband used to get irrationally upset about tiny things and then redirect that upsetness at me, I always considered that he may literally never have had the chance to learn these things before meeting me. He was, emotionally, a five-year-old. I can't expect greatness until he's had the opportunity to learn how to be great in the first place. Although, I don't put myself through abuse for the sake of another person's learning experience. If I ever feel unsafe or uncomfortable in an abusive situation, I just leave. That's with my five-year-old and my husband. I always tell my son, you've got a little body, but huge emotions, so sometimes they spill out a little bit. I don't want you to hurt me and regret it later. As soon as you're done letting those emotions out, I'll come in and hug you. Just yell for me. Then he screams into his pillow or destroy some Lego structures and calls me in to comfort him when he doesn't feel like those emotions are spilling out as much. At the end of his angry outbursts, he always cries in regret for having been angry in the first place. That vulnerability point is where we practice coping mechanisms for his anger. I saw similar emotions in my husband ten years ago, albeit less obvious. 
Angry adults are, internally, little five-year-olds whose emotions are spilling over, and they're scared. Not an excuse, but a shining light onto the anger process in their brains. Not sure where this rant came from today, but here it is. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. He never permanently destroys anything, nor harms himself during this. We practice together, as far as destroying the Legos. Really interesting reaction. I mean... I'm sure a lot of mothers have to deal with both their husbands and their kids' emotional outbursts, but I'm wondering if this person has some sort of psychology major or uh, social work experience or something, because it's really deep. I really, I actually learned a few things with that. Story three. This. The no reaction is the best reaction. I don't even entertain trash talkers, and if anything... Let them have their moment as it gives a decent perspective as to where their heads are at. I moved into a new neighborhood a few years back and have no idea what I did to get on one of my neighbor's bad sides. I've moved every 18 months of my life since birth and lived all over the world, and it wasn't until almost 40 that I came across the most vile and disturbed neighbor I've ever had. Shortly after moving in, I got invited to a little get-together and dude was projecting for almost an hour straight, giggling and laughing his butt off the whole time trying to get a rise out of me. He had spent some time looking me up online and was boasting about things he had found. I'm a former celebrity overseas, and my life is an open book, and I've had a few stalkers in the past. This guy took the prize for the most obsessed and weird. Weirdest interaction I've ever had when first meeting someone, let alone a new neighbor. Thanks to them, I cleaned up my online presence as I'm no longer famous, was a long time ago, and don't bother with people younger than me. We would have neighborhood watch meetings, and the guy or his boyfriend would make snide remarks about my son's attire. I never gave them the time of day, and everyone could see them festering from the weird obsession with being so negative. I'm a pretty self-aware dude and know if I'm committing a social faux pas, this dude apparently isn't. Let them keep talking without engaging, and it will speak volumes about them versus whatever it is they're accusing or bullying you for. Fracking weirdos. Yeah, I had an encounter on a flight recently where some women behind me were making fun of me and filming me to post online. I guess they were looking for one of those freakout moments to post online and go viral, because they kept indirectly saying things about me, hoping I would overhear and react while the camera was rolling. Once I overheard what was going on, I stopped moving or doing literally anything, and they whined the rest of the flight about having to delete the video because it was useless. I think they still posted something, but I won't put any effort to find it. I was angry about getting off the plane, but I later felt satisfied that I don't let that kind of behavior get to me. My dad said when I was really young and had my first instance of bullying, just ignore them. Sounded ridiculous at the time. 100% correct now. That, you have to develop some patience. And like we heard from the previous ones, sometimes there has to be some sort of acknowledgement that they're not expecting. Maybe there are times where you can just Ignore them and move on. That requires some patience on your part. And I don't know, what do you think? Is it better to ignore or just to try a strategy that lets that sort of acknowledges and lets it go? What do you think? Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.